Welcome everybody uh, at the Studium Generale Lunch Lectures. Um, this afternoon we have Arthur Schopenhauer, the great romantic philosopher, an intriguing figure. Please have a seat. Um, we had a lecture about Kant a couple of uh, weeks ago, and I think that was a good preparation for Schopenhauer, because Schopenhauer is, he, he called himself the only true heir of Kant, isn't it, uh, Nolan? So there is a very close connection between Kant and uh, Schopenhauer. Uh, I'm very happy that Dr. Nolan Gertz, who is an assistant professor at this university in the philosophy department, is willing to speak about Schopenhauer. Maybe you remember, uh, Nolan gave a great talk on the 1st of May about Karl Marx, and it was awesome. But now it's Schopenhauer. Nolan, the floor is yours. Great. A, a big hand for, uh, for Nolan, please. Thanks. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's uh, always fun to talk about Schopenhauer. I've never really had the opportunity to do so formally, so this is uh, an entertaining first for me, uh, as much as it might be for you. How many of you have, uh, have read Schopenhauer? A few, okay. How many of you have seen True Detective? Because then you've read Schopenhauer. So it's, uh, anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, so first of all, who was uh, Schopenhauer? Uh, one thing that's interesting to note, uh, I don't know if you, if you know this, but, but he was Dutch. So uh, you can, you can uh, embrace him as a countryman. Uh, his father was a Dutch merchant. His mother, uh, a German author. Uh, she was actually a very prolific, very famous author at her time, uh, friends with Goethe. Uh, and what's interesting is when um, uh, Schopenhauer uh, is a child, he's, he's being brought up to, to take over the family business. So he is supposed to become uh, a Dutch merchant, just like his dad. Uh, he's actually named Arthur, uh, a very Dutch way of thinking, uh, because it, it works so well in different languages. So this is, this is purely a commercial decision why he's named Arthur. Um, but his father dies uh, when Schopenhauer is 17. Uh, it's believed he committed suicide. Uh, so this actually frees uh, Schopenhauer to study philosophy. So if his father hadn't died, we would, we would not have Schopenhauer. So he, he goes to university, uh, first studies medicine, discovers his love of philosophy, studies philosophy with Fichte and Schleiermacher, uh, two important uh, neo-Kantian, post-Kantian thinkers, uh, who, like a good student, he will attack throughout his work. Um, he then, uh, like many Germans did, uh, flees uh, because Napoleon is coming. Uh, he goes and hides out, uh, sends his dissertation to the University of Jeddah, uh, which is also where Hegel sent his dissertation. Uh, the reason for this is he thought that if he sent it to Berlin, Napoleon would intercept his dissertation. So he sends it to Jena. Uh And when it's, got, when it's received at Jena, uh, this is again one of those interesting things, they, they basically uh, accept it, but uh, it's noted uh, that he's, he's the son of this famous author. So his, so his mother uh, basically helped him get a PhD by, by reputation, uh, which is fascinating because his mother hated his dissertation uh, and said, I think this is a book for pharmacists. Um, and he said, well, I'm sure my work will outlive yours. And she said, I'm sure the first printing will survive. Uh, in other words, no one will buy your book. So yes, it will survive. Anyway, just fun family history. <laughs> uh, so as you can see, uh, he publishes his dissertation when he's 25. He publishes his greatest work when he's 30. Uh, this is the, the 200th anniversary year of the world as will and representation. So uh, good timing for us. We did Marx on his 200th birthday, so let's do Schopenhauer on his book's 200th birthday. Um, when it's published, uh, nobody reads it, nobody cares. Just nobody cares. Uh, it's, it receives, I believe, three reviews. It, it just has no effect on anybody. Nobody cares. He goes to teach at the University of Berlin. Um, important background, he hates Hegel. Uh, Hegel is the most important philosopher at that time. He is dominating the Berlin scene. Uh, 
Schopenhauer goes to Berlin to, uh, to dethrone Hegel, schedules his class immediately at the exact same time down the hall from Hegel. Hegel gets 200 students, Schopenhauer gets five. Which I gotta say, that's, that's pretty good. That's higher than I expected. Uh, Schopenhauer teaches for, I believe, one semester and then quits academia. Uh, when his father died, he inherited his father's, I'd say fortune, but they were middle class, so whatever a middle class fortune was. He inherited that, lives off of it for the rest of his life, uh, and writes a lot of essays that nobody reads, attacking academic philosophy. So he leaves academia and then spends the rest of his life attacking academia. Um, he tries to return to Berlin, doesn't work out. He gets sued because he gets into a shoving match uh, with a woman whose office was down the hall from his apartment and her office was loud and it irritated his study. Um, he received uh, a copy of the Upanishads when he was very young and he would read it and meditate it every day. So for him, being, being, having quiet time was very important. So her, her loud business down the hall was very irritating and he, he shoves her. Uh, and loses a lawsuit over it. So he leaves Berlin, settles in Frankfurt, uh, publishes uh, Pererga and Perlipomena. I have no idea how to pronounce that, it's Greek. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a collection of his essays. Um, and this is when he finally receives recognition. It gets positively reviewed, people start to take his work seriously, and they start republishing all of his works. So uh, hopefully this is uh, uplifting for you. It's the only uplifting thing I'll say today. Um, and not just in this talk, I mean just generally, it's the only uplifting thing I'll say. Uh, that you can, you can still receive success when you're, when you're 62 years old. So if, you're <laughs> if you think you're gonna die in obscurity, you could have that last second. So he actually becomes very, very popular, very big, very influential, and then he dies, uh, which seems very Schopenhauerian. So he's, he's working on uh, revisions to will and representation when he dies, but it, but it is said that he died peacefully, uh, since it seems like that's the only thing he ever wanted to do in his life. So I guess that's, that's, he got what he wanted. Uh, and as you can, as you can see here, um, his poodle uh, was his favorite companion. Uh, so whenever someone uh, did a doodle, a doodle of Schopenhauer, it always included a poodle. Um, anyway, just fun fact. So what's Schopenhauer's actual philosophy? Now, what's interesting is if you open world as well representation, this is how the preface ends. It gives you some practical advice on uh, basically don't read my book. Um, and there are other ways you can use my book that are more useful to you. Uh, doorstop if your table is off. So he's a funny guy. But it is interesting that you would start a book by saying, by the way, don't read my book. So why does he say that? Well, he basically says there's, there's three rules you have to obey if you're going to understand him, which is a good way of saying, um, I have an easy job today because we're not going to do these things, so we're not going to understand him. It's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, so first, read the book twice. Always good advice. Uh, two, read his PhD dissertation, which would have been almost impossible to find. Uh, and then three, uh, understand the works of Kant, Plato, and the Upanishads. So if you don't do those things, this is what he lays out in the preface, just don't read my book. Um, what's interesting is, uh, we'll get this uh, when I get to Nietzsche later, uh, but you can see uh, Nietzsche's prefaces are almost written in the exact same style as Schopenhauer's. So you can, you can really understand better, I think, what Nietzsche is doing in his prefaces for what Schopenhauer was doing in his. So let's try to do maybe one of these things. Let's look at his dissertation. And if, if any of you are working on a dissertation now, it's a, it's a good example of uh, what a uh, 18th century dissertation looked like. So the second edition, uh, as you can see here, is being published when he's 60, which again means nobody read it when it first published when he was 26. Uh, but what's interesting is the, uh, the title on the fourfold root of sufficient reason. It's, the whole book is basically about this principle of sufficient reason, which, as he puts it uh, very early on, nothing is without a reason for its being. Now, I like uh, this formulation because it makes almost no sense. Um, 
There are a lot of ways of wording this, and he chose the most complicated, most confusing by far, which is very nice for a PhD dissertation. Uh, but basically, he has um, uh, four influences that are really, really driving the book. Uh, so you can see here, first Descartes. Uh, Descartes famously, uh, in the meditations, destroys the sciences, uh, gets rid of everything based on tradition, everything based on dogmatic acceptance, builds everything back up, mostly on causality. Bishop Barclay, uh, in his dialogues on Hylas and Philonis, um, builds up the world on his own, but for him, the world is based on God. And he says famously, essay es percipi, to be is to be perceived. So everything that exists, exists only because it is seen. This is the bedrock of Barclay's philosophy. If nobody's looking at it, it does not exist, is what everyone thinks he means, except, of course, God can see it. So it's God's perception that also keeps things alive. Remember, he is a bishop, after all. Uh, David Hume. Hume, famously, when he's 26, so again, this is a high bar for those of you around this age. You have, you have limited time left. Uh, when Hume is 23, he moves to Descartes' hometown uh, and writes uh, this very thick book, Treatise of Human Nature, uh, where he, he basically just uh, rips Descartes apart. And what's fascinating is he, he out Descartes' Descartes. Descartes uh, doubts everything, destroys everything, and Hume says, well, you you've didn't doubt enough, because you didn't doubt causality. So this is what Hume does. Hume removes causality. Because he says, if you look at experience, we cannot experience necessity. Necessity is the only thing we cannot experience, and causality is based on necessary connection. A, then B, it necessarily follows. And he says, at best, all we have is constant conjunction, that it does happen. But I have no way in experience of knowing why it had to happen. And this is what the principle of sufficient reason is all about. The idea that if something is, happens, if there is something true, if there is a fact, it is true, it is a fact, only on the ground that there is sufficient reason for why it had to happen, that it necessarily happened. In other words, the law of causality. Kant uh, famously says that Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumber. He's 50, so again, uplifting. 50 years old, and he's awoken by David Hume, 23. So there's still time for 50-year-olds to be woken up by 23-year-olds. I think this is what happened on Tuesday last week. Um, and I think the, the idea of what, what Kant wants to do can be uh, best explained. I apologize. Sorry. It's, it's always fascinating to me that Kant's portrait, his head is at the exact perfect angle for this meme. <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically, Kant's, uh, Kant's response to Hume is that Hume, Hume is obviously right. But if Hume is right, then science is wrong. And Kant cannot accept this. Newton just published his Principia, the Principia can't be wrong. He says it, it, it must be uh, true, so what do we do? He says, well, we have to work backwards, not forwards. Hume worked forwards. He starts from nothing and tries to build everything up. And he says, this is actually the wrong method. So he says, I'm going to adopt Newton's method and work backwards. This is what's known in philosophy as the transcendental method. I take what is, and I try to figure out its conditions of possibility. Rather than starting from nothing and try to build up to something, I start with the something and work backwards to what must be the case such that this is true. In other words, the principle of sufficient reason. And what's interesting is, sorry, one more time. Um, it's, it's really helpful to explain Kant through memes, I don't know. Um, this is what is famously known as the Copernican turn uh, in Kant that we need to uh, completely reshift how we think. This is, this is his awakening from dogmatic slumber. Hume is right. I cannot find causality in experience. And yet, we have causality, we have experience. So how do I explain it? I explain it, says Kant, that causality is in me, 
not in the world. It is me supplying causality. It is what he calls the category of understanding. It is how I experience the world. I cannot but experience the world as cause and effect. That does not mean that cause and effect is out there. Hume is right. It's in here. It's how I organize experience. So, like most philosophers, he has a subject-object dualism. And what's important is this idea, uh, famously known, um, the noumenal and phenomenal. So everything that I experience is phenomenon. And this phenomenon is the combination of form and matter. The form is me, the matter is the world. And when these two combine, we get phenomenal experience. So this helps to explain why, for example, I can't believe I forgot this meme in my presentation. Uh, what color is the dress? If you, if you remember that fight that ended Betty, Betty Barrages. Um, Kant helps to explain these, these kinds of arguments about, um, you know, is my jacket uh, dark blue or is it black? And you can just have fights back and forth over what color it really is. And this helps to explain about what we mean by really is. So Kant wants to say what really is, on the one hand, is what you experience, but on the other hand, it is this thing in itself out there that is underlying all phenomenal experience. Now, one big fight in Kant scholarship, but this isn't a Kant talk, so I'm not going to go over it, and I heard there was a study of generality about this, so hopefully it was discussed. Whether the thing in itself is the cause of the phenomenon, or if we have actually no idea. Because it's very important for Kant, and this will come up a lot, um, I cannot explain the thing in itself. It's unknowable, so I cannot say anything about it. And in the text, he just addresses it as a big X. The only thing I know about it is that I don't know anything about it. Now, Schopenhauer takes this, and he says, okay, I like this idea. We have uh, the relationship between uh, human beings as knowers and what is known. And it is, of course, the case that what is known is dependent on the knower. Objects are dependent on the subject. But what he says is this fourfold root, as the title suggests. Um, the principle of sufficient reason is more complicated than everyone else thinks. So, again, like a good PhD dissertation, he takes something that's already very complicated and makes it way more complicated. And he says, importantly, that for each kind of object, there is a different principle of sufficient reason. In other words, there's a different kind of, of argument, a different kind of reasoning that goes with each kind of thing. So, intuitive representations, these are uh, material objects in the world. Abstract representations, these are uh, concepts. Pure representations, this would be uh, space and time. And self-representations, this is my experience of myself. And he says, basically, uh, what German idealists and German romantics get wrong, what Hegel gets wrong, is that they use one kind of reasoning for a different kind of object. So this is how he just tears down uh, all of his contemporaries. If you have an object, you have an argument, you cannot go across, you cannot cross the stream. And he says, this is what Hegel does, this is what Fichte does, this is what Schelling does, this is what everybody does, except him, and he's right. So, what happens in the world is will and representation. He starts writing this immediately after the dissertation. By the way, it's it's fun story. So, uh, Schopenhauer is very arrogant. Uh, that's, that's one of his, his character traits. When he submits his dissertation to the University of Vienna, he attaches a letter to it and says, you know, please review this very carefully. I'm very sorry if I made any mistakes. Please let me know. But at the same time, he sends it to a publisher and self-publishes 500 copies. So he doesn't wait for their response. He's already published it. And he immediately turns it into his magnum opus, The World is Willed Representation. So, again, we start from this bedrock and then he makes one little switch. What if I move from what I know about me to everything? And basically says, um, 
one very important idea, that. So the world as will and representation, it's, it's very literal. That's what the world is. It's both of those things. It is will, it is representation, because will is representation. All representations are just the objectification of the will. Now, if you remember my Marx lecture, we talked a lot about objectification and the idea that when I make things, that is the objectification of my labor. Now we can see the Schopenhauerian root of Marx's thinking. So this is first influence. Now, what's interesting is, uh, again, his Upanishadian thinking. Uh, he basically says, everything that really is, the thing in itself, everything that exists, is one. We divide things, we individuate things, we describe individual things, but again, that's how they appear to us. In reality, there's just one thing, will. And he says, in its innermost essence, the kernel of every particular thing and also the whole, it appears in every blindly acting force of nature and also deliberate conduct of man. And the great difference between the two concerns only the degree of the manifestation, the inner nature of what is manifested. In other words, he says this. It's very simple. So he also inspires Star Wars. And I think Yoda kind of looks like him a little bit, so it's, it's probably not an accident. But this is really what he believes, that, that there is only oneness. That's reality. Reality is oneness. The problem is that we do not experience oneness, we experience plurality. But again, based on his Kantian way of thinking, the plurality is us. It's what we put onto the world, just like we put causality onto the world. So representations are not caused by the will, but are the will objectified and individuated by our experience. Every this, every then, every here, every now, that's us. Will exists outside time, exists outside space. Just like for Kant, the thing in itself did, because space and time are us. So if it is outside of us, it is outside space and time. And also, again, because different objects, different line of thinking, causality cannot be applied to will, because will is not that kind of object. Hence, there cannot be any cause. Instead, he uses this term, uh, representations are the mirror of the will. The world is the mirror. So, let's get to what everyone came here for, the pessimism. What on earth is he talking about here? Now, what's interesting is he says everything is will. And he gives this interesting, uh, this vision. He's a very good writer. Uh, and because of that, uh, much like with Nietzsche, uh, the poetic ramblings, uh, it's hard to make out uh, what is his imagination and what is his philosophy. Because he, he clearly has this vision of the will as just this, uh, this hunger. Like the, the, the nature of reality is hunger. And this idea that because it is the only thing that exists, it is just feeding on itself. And because we are will, this is what we are doing to ourselves and doing it to each other. And this is what is meant by homo homini lupus, uh, man is wolf to man. So in other words, will is wolf to will. Why is that the case? Well, first of all, how can we know anything about it? If it's the thing in itself, that according to Kant, we shouldn't know anything about it. Now, everyone after Kant does this one neat little trick. They say, I can know it. The one thing Kant says you can't do, everyone after Kant says, ha, 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 yeah, I get it. But I know it. I know it. <laughs> Why do I know it? Well, for Schopenhauer, I know it because, as Kant himself says, I am thing in itself. If everything that exists exists double as noumenal and phenomenal, then so too do I. And Schopenhauer takes this very seriously and says, well, then I am will and representation, which means I must have some knowledge of will because I am will. So starting from man, human body, he says, basically, I have this within me. 
Therefore, I can know the nature of the thicket itself by knowing my own nature. If I know myself, I know the will, I know reality. So the whole, whole of existence, says Schopenhauer, is in me. And he says, fascinatingly, that my body, again, like all representations, is will objectified. So uh, he says teeth are just the will's hunger objectified. Uh, he says genitals are just the will's desire objectified. So everything for him uh, is, is just in the body. And he says you can read someone's character on their face. So again, we, we have this sort of um, everything about you is right there. You can just see it. Right? So what do I know when I turn inward? What do I discover about the will? Eternal becoming, endless flux, belong to the revelation of the essential nature of the will. The same thing is also seen in human endeavors and desires that buoy us up with the vain hope that their fulfillment is always the final goal of willing. But as soon as they are to attain, they no longer look the same, and so are soon forgotten, become antiquated, and are really, although not admittedly, always laid aside as vanished illusions. It is fortunate enough when something to desire and to strive for still remains, so that this game may be kept up with constant transition, desire, satisfaction, fresh desire, rapid course of which is called happiness, the slow course sorrow, and so this game may not come to a standstill, showing itself as a fearful, life-destroying boredom, a lifeless longing without a definite object, a deadening languor. So, pessimism. This is what life is. This is what reality is. It is just going from desire to desire to desire to desire. This is how he describes the will, which again is the nature of reality. It does not have division, because again that comes from us. It does not have reason, because that comes from us. It does not have ground, that comes from us. It has no aim, that comes from us. It has no limit, that comes from us. It has no law, it comes from us. Meaningless, comes from us. It is blind impulse, endless striving. So again, the nature of reality is just hunger. And what's interesting is if you read Kant's uh, ethics, you can kind of see this in Kant already when he talks about uh, what freedom really is. And he says, freedom cannot be uh, doing whatever you want. Because what you want, what you desire, you have no control over that. So you can imagine again how Schopenhauer takes that and says, right, that's exactly right. I have no control over what I desire. But desire is everything, which means I have no control over anything. So, again, how does this work? He basically looks inside of himself and he sees desire. He has hunger, he has sexual urges, he has the desire to know. And what do all of these lead to? They lead to striving to be fulfilled. And he says, even if they are fulfilled, it's momentary. Again, you've, you've experienced this. You, this is why it's, it's good that this is a lunch lecture because you had a little sandwich and you were briefly full and now while sitting here, you're hungry again. It's, it's already coming. You know it's coming. You have no control over it. You might have the urge to go to the bathroom and again, you have no control over it. You can fight it. You can struggle against it, but it will win. You know this. So this is what Schopenhauer is experiencing. And again, it's very important um, that I know the will through me. So if this is what's true of me, that I just go back and forth, desire fulfillment, desire fulfillment, that this is endless striving, that that's what the will is. If it's true of me, it's true of reality. So there's life. Life is moving from desire to desire. Desiring is suffering. So life is suffering. Again, a very Hindu way of thinking. This is how he describes, um, he throughout world is one representation is quoting the Upanishads. And he says in the preface, you could derive the Upanishads from my book, but you couldn't do it the other way around. It's a very fascinating way. <laughs> I said he's arrogant. And he discovers Buddhism later in life 
because um, he actually has a neighbor uh, who's a Sanskrit scholar, so he studies uh, Buddhism as well, and is very excited to be like, oh, right, they, they also said what I said. Great. So everywhere he looks, he sees himself, it's very accurate. Now, again, because representation is will objectified, what is true of representation is true of will. So the nature of life, all life, all existence, is striving. Striving is struggle. Life is struggle. This is the nature of reality, struggle. So again, as I, as I hinted at earlier, if you're a pessimist, this is pessimism. If you're a true detective, you just have Matthew McConaughey quoting Schopenhauer. And it is, uh, this is pretty much, uh, pretty much Schopenhauer. Um, I think Schopenhauer writes it a little better, but you know, this is Schopenhauer's version. By virtue of such necessity, man needs the animals for his support. The animals in their grades need one another, and also the plants, which again need soil, water, chemical elements in their combinations. The planet, the sun, rotation and motion around the sun, the obliquity of the ecliptic, and so on. At bottom, this springs from the fact that the will must live on itself since nothing exists besides it, and it is a hungry will. Hence arise pursuit, hunting, anxiety, and suffering. This is where I would play the Hungry Like the Wolf music video, I think. Um, but again, it's this fascinating idea. All is one, and all is feeding on itself. So even though we experience different things, he says still what we experience is everything feeding on everything below it and striving to make itself perfect. So what Hobbes describes as the war of all against all, what he describes as a state of nature as the war of all against all, Schopenhauer just says, right, that's what it is. It's the war of everything against everything, except unlike Hobbes, who thinks we can, we can get out of it, Schopenhauer says, no, that's just it. That's all it is. It's just war, all against all, forever, except there is no time. So forever, that's just our perception of it. But really, it's just that's how it is, period. Is there optimism? <laughs> uh, question mark. I mean, he does, he does sort of say that we can withdraw from this. We can throw off its yoke. We can become free from the will. How do we do it? He gives you some hint. So, again, life is striving. Striving is struggle. Life is struggle. Could we at least just kill ourselves? I mean, if you're, if you're a pessimist, this would be optimism. And what's interesting is... Uh, What's well, interesting is he addresses this, and he says, quite simply, no. Because the will wants you to die. You were created to die. So killing yourself won't get you out of this. It'll just give the will what it wants. So there's your, there's your why, why not kill yourself answer. Because people do ask me this a lot. Peter Paul once asked me, why don't you just kill yourself? Well, this is the answer. Why bother? <laughs> the ultimate pessimistic response. <laughs> but is there salvation? There you go. If suicide can't do it, is there anything we can do? And what's interesting, he says, um, the greatest suffering is from knowledge. The more we know, the more pain we experience. You've probably experienced this yourself in each year of study. More pain. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that like, I want you all to get um, a higher and higher degree, but in another way that means I want you to get a higher and higher pain threshold. So that's, uh, and, and Aristotle does say very clearly in the Nicomachean Ethics that that is what education is. It's just pain. Um, but because knowledge is pain, then basically the way to get rid of pain, the way to get rid of suffering, is in a sense to get rid of knowledge. And it's important, again, if the principle of individuation, if what I experience is from me, and the more I try to learn about things, the more I individuate. In other words, analysis, 
It is analytic philosophy that is suffering. That's, that's really the heart of what he's talking about here. The more you analyze, the more you divide, the more suffering you create. So you need to stop doing that. That's, that's what he's trying to do. That's salvation. So how do you do that? He basically gives two answers. In book three of World as World as, Repre World as World Representation, he says the answer is art. In book four, the answer is morality. Specifically, he says the answer is music in book three. He says music um, is metaphysical thinking that doesn't know it's doing metaphysics. And what's interesting is he basically invents on the spot the idea of the movie score and movie soundtrack. He says music um, actually reflects existence. Music is existence. And he goes through it. I'm, I'm not a music scholar, so I wasn't going to go through that detail at all because I would have no idea what I'm talking about. But he talks about how very specific octaves and very specific notes reflect very specific experiences. So if you experience music, you experience reality. And this is uh, obviously going to inspire, inspire uh, composers because he says they're the greatest geniuses. So that's, a, that's an easy way to get a target audience. Morality, on the other hand, he says, um, so if you have the genius on the one hand, on the other hand, you have the saint. And he says, in the saint, we see the moral ideal, the ability to actually experience the pain of others. So this is a way to get out of your own pain, is to reflect on the pain of others, to experience their pain. And very importantly, because all is one, he does not just mean human pain. He doesn't mean human compassion. He means compassion with animals, plants, with all that exists. Because again, for him, everything that exists is in pain. Right? That's what it means to say life is striving and that all is one. Everything is striving. He goes into a careful analysis of different insects, different plants, different crystals, and sees in all of them examples of pain. It's really a beautiful analysis. And it's a good reminder of when philosophers used to like know contemporary science and when contemporary scientists used to write in a manner that philosophers could understand. Because we've, we've bifurcated. I do not walk into Nano Lab and have any idea what anyone's talking about, and they have no interest in me having any idea what they're talking about. It's just two different buildings, two different worlds. Um, but again, Schopenhauer actually studied medicine and then moves into philosophy, and that's what a lot of people at that time did. So they really understood the contemporary science very well, and it plays into their metaphysics very well. And that's again what's so fascinating about these system philosophers of the 18th and 19th centuries, that they really tried to paint all knowledge into one system. So you could not really do philosophy without knowing science, and you couldn't do science without knowing philosophy. The two fed off of each other. So again, if you're a true scientist, you would have compassion for all living things. So in both cases, you're trying to quiet the will. How do you do that? You recognize oneness. You stop individuating, you stop dividing, unite, unite, don't divide, unite. You stop the striving, you stop the struggle. Live an ascetic life. Live like a saint. Listen to music, meditate, read the Upanishads. Basically, just do what Schopenhauer did. <laughs> now, five minutes. five minutes. Okay, great. So, five minutes. Schopenhauer's influence. There's three big ones. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of pessimists running around. Uh, but here are three of the most famous pessimists you could find. I'm going to focus on two because they're connected to each other. Um, <clears throat> so what's interesting is today, we think of Nietzsche as a philosophy for teenage boys. Um, but when Nietzsche was a teenage boy, Schopenhauer was philosophy for teenage boys. So he finds Schopenhauer as a teenager walking through a bookstore, and Wagner did the same thing, even though Wagner was way too old. He was just an adult teenager, basically. Um, and the two of them become a BFF over uh, Schopenhauer. Nietzsche will ultimately uh, break from Wagner and from Schopenhauer. He breaks from Wagner because he's an anti-Semite. So again, Nietzsche 
uh, as much as he's connected to Nazism, uh, was not a Nazi and would have hated the Nazis. His sister was a Nazi. He was not a Nazi. He said, if I could, I would drown every anti-Semite in a river. And then his sister crossed that part out. So outlive your siblings. <laughs> and to Wagner, he basically says, uh, you know, Schopenhauer is for teenagers. You should have grown out of Schopenhauer by now. You're an old man. What are you doing still doing Schopenhauer? So, untimely meditations. He says Schopenhauer was his great educator. Schopenhauer was who he found when he needed him. Uh, this is like, uh, you know, if you found like an incel Reddit community, Schopenhauer would be like exactly what they need, right? Um, and that's basically what Nietzsche was. Um, but what's interesting is in, um, in the genealogy of morals, um, he really, really rips Schopenhauer apart. And he says, um, on the one hand, uh, his books, is, I kept saying hunger. He would say it's about being horny. Um, and it's really about how to stop being horny. And this is why it's so important that Schopenhauer was 26 years old when he was writing this. So it's not an accident. Young man filled with desire sees the world as desire that cannot be quenched. Um, and what's interesting, he says, right, Schopenhauer sees this in himself, but why does that have anything to do with reality? So world as will and representation is just Arthur as will and representation. It has nothing to do with anything else. Because um, again, just like Hume wants to out Descartes Descartes, uh, Nietzsche wants to out Schopenhauer Schopenhauer. You're just, you're describing yourself. Just admit it. Be honest. It's just you. There's no reason this has anything to do with anybody else. Now, what's fascinating is that, um, again, the will to life is very important to Schopenhauer. That is the nature of reality. Life is struggle. And Nietzsche just says, yeah, but that's great. That's not pessimism. That's optimism. And he just embraces it. This is what amor fati, right? Love your fate. We should not hide. We should not resign from this. Because he says that's the will turning against life the great danger to mankind. This is what, for him, nihilism, Schopenhauer. So, this is uh, the great influence. And I don't want to say necessarily that pessimism is nihilism, but it's very important, um, and I try to work this out in my book coming out next year, um, that pessimism is great for provoking nihilism. So it's Schopenhauer is necessary to awaken Nietzsche. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> Nolan Gertz, thank you very much for this, this fascinating talk. I really uh, enjoyed it. Um, it's, of course, way too short. You could talk hours about Schopenhauer and his influence and his thinking. Uh, but uh, I think you did a great job uh, showing his life and his, his works. And uh, I think it's a good... Uh, start for you to start reading Schopenhauer or Nolan Gertz, who is inspired by, uh, by Schopenhauer, very important. Um, uh, you will be here for a couple of questions, I think, afterwards, but you can do one question um, in, in, in uh, public. We have one minute left for the question and the answer. Uh, is there a very important question right now which you want to address to Nolan? I, I have one myself. Could you say something more about the Upishan, how do you, the, the, the Upanishads. Buddhist, yeah, Upanishad, sorry. Yeah. The, uh, how did he get it? And it was a Hinduistic. Yeah, I think his mother what, gave it to him. What, was, what kind of book was that? Yeah, the Upanishads is the uh, basic of uh, Vedic uh, philosophy or Hinduism. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it preaches this idea of the oneness. Um, so he talks about, for example, um, the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, which is one section of this greater work, the Mahabharata, which is the greatest, no the greatest novel, but it's also the longest novel ever written. Mm -hmm. um, I highly recommend it if you have a few hundred years. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's this famous scene in it where uh, there's, a, there's a war. It's, it's a, um, a great uh, TV show, actually, in India, uh, where they tried to, tried to uh, like Game of Thrones, do the do the Barabarta as a TV show, and it actually kind of had led to like a Hindu revival in India through this TV show. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's a great war. Um, and Arjuna, who's leading the battle, uh, stops before going into battle and says, well, I don't, I don't want to kill all these people. It's, it's my brothers versus my cousins. This, mm -hmm. I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And Krishna appears, Lord Krishna, uh, and, and talks him into the war. And that's the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita is this great, here's why you should kill people book. Um, but the reason you should kill people, he says, is basically they're all me. We're all one. So you can't really kill anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's fine. And this was all destined in advance. So like, it's going to happen anyway. You can't do anything about it. There is no free will. Mm -hmm. um, which Schopenhauer embraces very much. So mm -hmm. he, he talks a lot about this idea that we experience freedom, but we are not free. Uh, he does not believe in free will. That would be a whole other lecture if we wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so there's, there's a, lot, uh, a lot in Hinduism that is very important for what Schopenhauer is doing. And he helps to really, um, as much as we love yoga now, mm -hmm. uh, there was sort of a yoga movement uh, in, in Germany at this time yeah. too that, uh -huh. that Nietzsche hated. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, Nolan, thank you once more. It was a fascinating uh, talk you gave. Um, uh, Nietzsche, Star Wars, uh, Schopenhauer, of course. Um, it, it was awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks. And um, I hope to see you another time with another philosopher. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. A big hand for Nolan. <laughs> Great.